let's start. I'm going to talk like this the whole night. All right, welcome everyone. Doing some fun Halloween stuff. <laughs> Let me kill that a little bit. Yeah, welcome to the Wednesday show. Every Wednesday, HRTV, we go live right here. Great to see everyone in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. We have Halloween this weekend. How exciting is that? Hopefully kids can uh, get out there and find some candy out there. Uh, I know we, we certainly will. We'll get a little resourceful. Yes, I am the Headless Horseman. Don't worry, I'll put this, uh, <laughs> I'll put this back to normal. As I mentioned uh, last week, kind of new format. This is the last week of the month in which we're going to do Q&A. Most of these questions come from all the different videos uh, that I've put together. And, uh, and who not better to have on the show is, uh, is Kevin. Kevin to help us answer them. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. I think this will be a pretty cool overview of some of the videos that we've done. Grab uh, questions that maybe a lot of you've had. And, uh, you know, let's face it, when you're getting into it, a lot of this stuff is confusing. So, so Kevin, welcome. You can't... Uh, cool. You can't see this, but you're also keyed with the headless horseman. I'm also I'm also keyed. Well, I, you know what? I um I managed to hook up another screen, so I can I can look to my right and I see uh, Jason, the headless horseman, with the uh, the pumpkin head in your hand, and then of course I see my um, what could be considered a, a a version of a pumpkin head right there down in front of you. So really really cool. We're glad. All of you, how many of you? Oh, my, my goodness, there's already 29 people, according to uh, my screen, and uh, that's really cool. Really glad you took the time out to come hang out with us here tonight at Ham Radio TV. Hey, real quick, only because we're, we're critical like that, can you pull back your audio? I think Zoom is flattening you out. I think you're driving too Zoom much, a little hard. Too much audio for Zoom. Yep. You know... It's always something. And guys, try to, uh, in the chat, definitely uh, say hello, say what's going on. If you have a good question, try to hold that to the end, but I will do my best to pull it out of chat because, you know, as people are saying hello to everyone, it gets hard to, uh, to keep track of that. All right. How, how's that? Is it a little better? Yeah, it's a little bit better. A little better. I, we, we overdid it on the... We, we overdid it on the DBs, Jason. Yeah, I know. Yeah, too many, too many, too many DBs. Too many dog biscuits. All right, Kevin. That's right. Too many, too many dog biscuits. That's right. So, oh my goodness. Let's start with uh, with question number one, and uh, this was uh, how to build a dipole. Uh, if you guys are familiar, uh, this is a very popular video on the channel. Um, and by the way, I'm going to put a link to a playlist of all these videos we'll be talking about in the descriptions of the, uh, of, of the description of this video. So the first one is how to build a dipole. And this gentleman here, Robert, he emulated the test that, uh, you did using an MFJ 269 and a T connector with a dummy load and a random length of coax. I did attain the same results as you did. The VSWR was 2.2 at length A, and adding two feet of the coax brought it down to one to one. But why, when I add the dummy load to the coax, length A, I also saw a one to one match? Now, if the dummy load is representing the antenna and the antenna is one to one, why is the cable in your test with the T connector that was showing 2.2 now showing 1.1 when, when connected directly? to the, uh, the SWR antenna dummy load. I feel this test is just showing the change in phase angle, not necessarily a change in residence due to a non-resident length. So a lot of words there, but Kevin, how, can you, words. how can you simplify and uh, give okay. us something straightforward? I'm gonna change this background while you're talking. All right, all right, so, <clears throat> well, what we were trying to demonstrate that last time with the, with the coax links and, uh, and uh, the dummy loads and things is, we were specifically talking about a half wavelength piece of cable at a particular frequency. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go really quick. I'm going to run through that uh, test again. 
just so everybody can. And by the way, uh, in case, in case, uh, let's see. Question eight. Modex, I think I printed it out here, Jason. So I think it's a uh, Modex twenty. Is that? Am I reading that right? Question yes. eight. So question eight. I don't have your name, sir. But anyways, we're gonna we're gonna try to try to shed a little bit of light and clarity on both of these questions about what we were what I was doing with the coax. So okay, for just FYI, this is a piece of RG eight RG eight X. Okay, and. I ordered this, and you probably y'all probably heard me say this. I, I ordered this off of uh, the internet, and I just got one that said RG8X is 50 feet. And the reason I like to use RG8X is because, you know, it's reasonably flexible. It's not really heavy, and it's a little bit on the, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a little bit on the interesting side I, I it does a it does great for these demonstrations so what we're going to do first is we're going to set up the right here we're going to set up the uh, mfj just like we did before okay so i happen to have a um a 50 ohm dummy load that i've used it on on several of my analyzers and it, it's pretty good I don't know if you can see it right now, but you can see that it's at 1.9 megahertz. It's a 1.0 match. It's 52 ohms, and the reactance is zero. So that's really good. So let's just move it up here to a higher frequency. And now we're at 10 megahertz. It's reading the same thing. Now I want to crank this up as high as it will go on this particular scale. Now we're up to 28 megahertz, okay? which is the top of the amateur radio HF band. And that's what we were concerning ourselves with earlier. And the reason we, the reason I do this quick little test is within the limits of my MFJ and just basic operation of it, it's telling me that this dummy load is 52 ohms at all these frequencies. Okay? And it's going to give me a reasonably accurate measurement. So now we've established that our, 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 our 50 ohm load is actually 52 ohms, which is fine. And now we're going to grab the end of the 50 foot of RG8X. Now, normally I would go into the explanation of how we would, you know, look up the cable, get the velocity factor, figure out, try to figure out mathematically what the uh, half wavelength frequency of this thing is. But we're just gonna measure it with our MFJ. We're just gonna, we're just gonna use the good old MFJ to do that. So can we still see the screen okay, Jason, the MFJ? Yeah, we're seeing it good. Okay. Good, okay, so notice the SWR, it went crazy. Now, we're not really, looking for SWR as much as we're looking for we want this piece of coax we want to find the frequency that this piece of coax does not affect our reading on the 50 ohm load and when we find that number that's going to be very 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 close to the half wavelength of this piece of coax at that frequency and notice down here in the 80 meter band it's not happening because this cable is too short so now i'm going to move it up here and i'm going to start oh look at that so now i've taken it and i've moved it around and i'm going to dip it and about the best i can come up with on this particular meter i'm still at a 1.0 I still got a zero here, and it's telling me it's 49 ohms. You know, my test setup is affecting the, the impedance just slightly, but this is telling us that this piece of cable, it is half wavelength at, well, 8 megahertz. Well, 
if that's true, what we ought to be able to do is we should be able to take our knob and we should be able to double this frequency and go to somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 megahertz. And look at that. That's where it dipped. 16 megahertz. And there we go. So that's 816. Now I should be able to go eight, another half wavelength, go up to 24. And there we go. It's right there, right at 24. Okay. So all we've proven with this little test, or what we've discovered is this piece of coax, the lowest actual half wavelength frequency this thing is capable of, is about 8 megahertz, <coughs> which is really close to the 40 meter band. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. <coughs> Man, someone should build me a cough switch. So anyways, so that's what it's doing. So you ask yourself, okay, what does that mean when I put my dummy load on there? Well, let's do that. I'm going to disconnect this dummy load from here, okay? And I'm going to connect the... <laughs> hey, we already, we, are, we already got one president sick. Can't afford another. No, it's not. It's I, I have a reason. <laughs> okay. it's, it's not what you think it is. So now what we're going to do is, if you can see me right here, here's the end of the coax right here. Here's the same dummy load, and I'm going to plug it in to the end of the coax. Okay. And we're going to make sure our connections are reasonably taut. We don't want to. Don't 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 grill don't gorilla your test connections, you know. Make them nice, but don't over tighten stuff. So now we're gonna turn it back on. And we're gonna go right back to here. We'll wait for the meter to uh, calm down. We're gonna go back down here to the low, lower frequencies and start out what we what we did with the open piece of coax. So we determined earlier through our basic test that this piece of coax, it wasn't giving us a half wavelength uh, at 80 meters. So what does that really mean to me with my 50 ohm load or my 50 my antenna? Now, keep it in mind that our antenna would have to be really close to 50 ohms at that frequency. When you move off the frequency, your, your numbers will change. So now I'm going to just sweep it all around. And as you can see, it never got below 1.5. Because this is actually a quarter wavelength at 80 meters. And it is not representing the, the impedance of my antenna back here. It's actually adding uh, a transformer between here and here. So it's never going to read that. Now, if I were to take it and I start turning my dial, and you already see that, I start turning my dial, and you'll notice that throughout the different frequencies, it's changing. Now, notice now, the closer we get to 40 meters, now we're going to get up to 7 mega cycles. Look at that. We're at the bottom of the 40 meter band. It's 1.2. And it's 54. I would say that's pretty dang good. Now I'm going to keep going, keep going. And notice it's getting better and better and better as I get closer and closer. Now I'm getting really close. I'm going to dip, dip my, dip it here. And my dip is really, really close to 8 megahertz. So that's a half wavelength. So now what we're doing is the cable at a half wavelength which just happens to be 8 megahertz it's the it basically reflects the load impedance or my dummy load impedance back to my meter and 
the little extra resistance at two ohms is just the the de- the loss in the cable. The cable is going to have some loss. So your in your meter will reflect that. But that's awful close because when I move this meter, or excuse me, this load back to the meter, it's it's 52. Here we are at eight megahertz. Now let's just for fun, let's crank this puppy up to 20, closer to 24. Look at that. 1.0 and it's 54. It's the same thing. So really, all we've all we've proven is that this piece of cable, its half wavelength resonance is 8 megahertz. That means it'll do it at um, 16 and uh, 24, and you add 8 to that, you know, be 32. Matter of fact, let's find out. I'll do this on camera, and we'll see what happens when we get another 8. Oh, look at that. Okay. I'm back down to 1.1 and 0, and I added up uh, another another ohm of resistance. What's from 54 to 55? Well, as we go up in frequency, the cable's going to start becoming slightly lossier. So there we go. 8, 16, 24, 32, and we use this antenna or this dummy load. Now, let's go back real quick, and let's go to our 7 megahertz spot. So I use this 50-foot piece of cable, and it's actually really, really good at 8 megs. But I go, I want to use it at, you know, I'm a 40-meter guy. I'm going to use it down here at 40 meters. So I'm going to crank this sucker down to 7.2 give or take. And 7.2, you know, I'm still at around 54 ohms. I'm at 1.1. And that's a very, that's a, that's a, who would, who would complain about that? So could you use this piece of cable on your uh, 40 meter antenna? Yes. If you build your 40 meter antenna and your 40 meter antenna is not resonant at this frequency, Will it affect the reading on your meter? Absolutely. So all we're really saying is if you cut your cable in half half wavelength multiples for the frequency you want to use, okay, it will reflect the load impedance back to the the source. In this case, it's our meter. In the real world, it's your radio. And there's going to be bandwidth there, you know. So when you move off that frequency, you're, you're better off. So, but let's just say, as it's going to be hard for me to, uh, I can't demo this with the cable. But if I made this cable an oddball length, and it was like, you know, my SWR on the frequency I wanted to use it, just ignore the frequency, was 1.3 or even higher 1.4 or maybe 1.5 because I got an odd length of this particular coax, then it's to your advantage to measure it and figure it out and get your coax length closer, as close as you can to the half wavelength multiple so that when you put your MFJ on there, it's ready to go. I can't tell you how many times we've had uh, operators put up their 80 meter antenna on a 25, 30, 30 foot pole, use 50 feet of RG 8X because it's very, very handy and very, very cost effective. And then say, I can't get my SWR below like 1.8. That's, I just can't do it. Well, right off the bat, you're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5, even if it was perfect. And then if your antenna is just a tad bit off, it's going to be a little bit more. So that's what we're looking at. We're, We're looking at half wavelength multiples so that the coax just represents the load impedance, which is your antenna, back to your radio, even if it's wrong. Okay? So if you if you calculate it out where it's seven point two and used your MFJ or or whatever device you wanted to use, go man, I got it perfect. And then you hook up an antenna that's not tuned correctly, you will get an interesting reading. It'll be, it'll just, it'll just be wrong. So now real quick, I'm going to give you guys, gals, a quick visual 
Okay. I hope I hope will help you. Let's do this. Um, bring this up. Yeah, you move this over here. And like I said, guys, what uh, what we're covering tonight is previous videos, so we're not doing as as a deeper dive that uh, we've done before. Right. Um. So I'll uh I'll get that playlist here i'll drop in the comments it'll be down in the description of this video and uh okay are we seeing that jason yes let me get that dialed in for you let me um i'm getting i need to get it i need to get it better on my screen here let's see there we go oh man i gotta move this out of the way hold on i i got you zoomed in and enhanced Wow! Because I was trying to, uh, I was trying to zoom in on okay. your analyzer. That's a tough little guy to see. No, oh, this guy? No, I'm just going screen sharing right yep. now. That's all we need to do. I got gotcha. you. Now so, we're, we're seeing YouTube stuff, by the way. I think you grabbed your wrong screen. No, I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. Here, I'll stop it. Okay, what are you seeing now? Uh, yourself. Okay. All right. By the way, as Kevin dials this in, uh, here is the playlist. So these are the videos we'll be talking about tonight. Um, as you can see here, let me get this over here. How to build a dipole, how to measure coax, intro to balance, building an inverted V, a little bit on the uh, how to connect a boom mic, and is your coax good? So you, you see what what you're finding out. I think so. Is there is so much cool science involved with building an antenna? There's a lot of ways to do it. There's the textbook, and then what I like to call this is you know the Elmer way, if you will. It, so we got the right screen now. Yeah. So I'm seeing. Oh, here we go. I got to drop this. Yes, we are good. Okay. And, and so what yeah. I was saying is uh, Kevin has read a handful of books. He's done it a lot. And I like how Kevin can condense it down to us. So this is why I call it the Elmer way. And I, and I hope everyone out there does have someone that can Elmer them. So what do you got, Kevin? You've got the rig expert displayed on a computer screen. How cool is that? Yeah, trying to get this dude here off i don't want that i don't want that there anymore i want him to go away anyways okay so what we're going to do is we're just going to open excuse me for looking over off to the side but so i used rg 8x okay so this is what rg 8x looks like on a um on a rig expert analyzer and as you can see okay the half wavelengths are right here and it's difficult to see but that's eight megahertz look on your screen see if you can see it that's eight megahertz then we're going to go up here there's 16 megahertz okay and then we go up here and here's on or about 24 megahertz so now what we're going to do is we're going to open up the other one which has the that's the exact same piece of cable with the 50 ohm load on the end. So now if you're looking at it and you can see this SWR here is about 1.5. And this is in the 80 meter band right here. Now there's 4.5. We're going to come up here. There's 8 meg. Look at that. So here's where your, your coax with the 50 ohm load is very happy. Here's another place where it's very happy. There's another place. So what I've been suggesting to people, especially with RG8X, is try to get your coax cut really close to the multiple. So if you if you get a multiple down here in 80 meters, it around 36, 3.6, it hits about 7.2, and then you hit about 14.4, and you're like, well, that's not perfect. Well, that's right. It's not. But you're in the groove, you see? You're in this, you're in the valley here that everybody's happy. Okay. It just works better. And that's, this is RG8X. 
And then if we were to uh, look at it a different way, this is called return loss. This will answer another question from uh, another viewer. They were asking me, man, if my return loss number is really high, that can't be good. Well, no, the higher your return, lo return loss high, SWR low. So you come over here and you're looking at, look, there's a return loss of over like 33, 34 dB right here. There's 32, 33, 34. So there it is on the dummy load. Okay. There it is at the higher frequency on the dummy load. And there it is. So it's a very good return loss. And as, and as you um, uh, look at it here, it gets worse and worse and worse, you see. So over here in 80 meters, it's just, it's just not as good. And to get a comparison, here's our SWR. See, it's just the inverse. So that's just a graphical representation of what that piece of coax will do for you. Now, let me um, grab this. I'm going to just take this piece of cable here. Hope everybody can see that. This is a 50-foot piece of LMR 400, okay? So what I did, and I will clear out these, and what we're going to do is we're going to go over to LMR 400 open. Take a look at it. Whoa, look at that. And notice that that 50-foot piece of LMR 400 has the half-wavelength multiples very similar to our friend RG8X. Okay, because it we're looking at the half wavelength multiples, and that's what that test was for. But everybody knows that LMR 400 is better cable, so now we're going to look at LMR 400 with the dummy load. Wow, holy guacamole! Get out of here! Look at that. Okay, so you go use a much, much better cable, LMR 400, and yeah, you can see in between here where you're not on the half wavelength, but it's behaving really, really good as far as SWR, and then you get over here on your half wavelength, they line up virtually perfectly, almost perfectly, and this is a piece of cable, LMR 400 that is uh, 50 feet long. So that's telling us that get better cable does a better job. So here's 100 feet of building 8242. And notice that we have a half wavelength multiple right down here in the 80 meter band. It's just beautiful. There it is. And there's 40 meters. And uh, we just keep working our way up. So we can also take a quick look at what did that look like with uh, a dummy load. Look at that. That cable behaved really, really well. So the half wavelength multiples is just a an experiment or a process and looking at it saying what what length of cable would it be so the input uh, or the load impedance is transferred or reflected back to the uh, source in a half wavelength. And here they are. And the half wavelengths, you know, on these frequencies are really close. So now I'm going to do one more just for fun. I get this question all the time. Can we use 75 ohm cable be like, uh, uh, you know what? I want to clear that one because I want to show you the other one. Good first. old stuff you got laying underneath your house. <laughs> yeah, man. This is this is RG11. Here's the open-ended test. And this piece is about 101 feet, something like that. Look how similar it is to the other cable, the half wavelengths. It's really, really close because the length is really, really close. And the velocity factor was, you know, pretty close. But we want to put a 50 ohm dummy load on the end of it because I'm going to put my perfect 50 ohm antenna on it, supposedly. Look what happens, guys. 75 ohm cable with a 50 ohm load. Look at that. It behaves. 
Here is an SWR of about 1.5. Okay? And then it goes back up here. And that's above 4 megahertz. So you can pretty much say I can I can use this 75 ohm cable with a 50 ohm antenna uh and and have an SWR that's quite acceptable. Then you move up here to 40 meters. Can you do it there? Oh yeah, you can do it at 40 meters. You can get up there and then uh there's I can't read that. And it gets that this cable here is the wrong length for uh for 20 meters. It's not 20 meters is right here. It would not work good. Your SWR would be about two to one or worse because the cable is a little is not quite the right length. But we'll talk we can talk about that more later. But there you go. You could use this 75 ohm cable right here in the 80 meter band. And if it was a little bit longer, uh, it would lower this frequency and it would these these would line up closer to your um, line up closer to the ham bands. So that's just an, a little quick example of you know what we what we were trying to uh, what we were trying to accomplish, and, okay. and just I hope, to, that, I hope that answers a question. Yeah, absolutely. No, that was good. And you know, you hear the the uh, the value fifty ohms a lot, and and there's a reason for that. You know, where our cable we're looking for fifty, not seventy five. Our radios are looking for fifty, and that's because when you build your antenna. Ideally, you're going to build a, a half wave length antenna. At a half wave, a perfect, beautiful antenna is 50 ohms. So, so that's where the magic is. That's why we're using either a 50 ohm resistor or a dummy load or something of that yeah. nature. Because in a perfect world, your antenna will be 50 ohms. Okay. Well, let's go on to Well, we kind of, well, let's see. How about uh, two? two uh, question two won't take too long. <laughs> well, it says how to measure coax loss, loss, and it says one dB equal. Okay, I that I don't understand. One dB is twenty percent. I'm not sure where, where he's where well, that person's going with that. Let's just quickly so, review uh, what is a decibel. What, well, a, a decibel is a unit of measurement, and it depends on what you're referencing it to. So here we go. We got another. Uh, I'm going to share the screen again because these guys here are awesome. Mini circuits. Is that up there now? Yes. Okay. So here is a DBM volts watts conversion. And you say, well, what is a DB? Well, what is one DB? Well, one DB here is referenced to zero DB is 0.225 volts at, or one milliwatt. So one DB is... There you go, 1.25 milliwatts. Well, if I increased it 3 dB, you go down here and it would be 2 milliwatts. Well, if I increased it 3 more dB, it'd be 4. And I bet you guys could probably guess it. If we guess, added 3 more dB, it'd be 8. And then it would just go 16. And it just goes all the way up. Because you know, we're, we, that's, that's good enough. That's because the... Um, what they're doing is, is they're giving you a reference at zero dB is one milliwatt. So that's what they're referencing everything to. And when you're doing power and you add, you double your power, you add three dB, you're doubling your power. If you cut your power in half, you're taking away three dB. And if you, you know, and if uh, anybody cares, so if for power, it's going to be, the formula is 10 log over power, P is for power, out over power in. Okay? So, and if this is for power, and if you're going to do voltage gain, it's, it's just 20 log, and that'll be V out over V in. So we're not going to do a bunch of math or anything like that tonight, but there you go. The when you somebody says, "Hey, I'm uh, so many dB," well, it's in reference to what. So when you're talking, uh, you know, power and uh, things of that nature, there's a chart, and at 50 ohms, it's one milliwatt. It's just like you can look at the six. They have another chart for audio. It's uh, 
one milli uh, zero db is one milliwatt at 600 at 600 ohms so there's different charts and different strokes for different folks depending on what they're doing so the db is a unit of measurement and it's referenced to something hope that helps i like it okay do you want to go to step three bit of balance Oh, okay. This one's easy. But his question is more towards, you know, what mix? What, what's the idea yeah. of the mix? And when you go shopping for, what can you tell us? Um, based on what little I know in my experiments, the Type 43 material has, has been a really universal material. And I noticed that it worked really good from, uh, you know, 40 meters all the way up to, you know, in my experiments, it behaved quite well at 10 meters. But what I noticed is, is if I wanted to go down into the, uh, say, 160, 80, and 40 was my uh, bands of preference, I found that the um, the Type 31 worked a little bit better. It gave me a little bit flatter response. But if you're just doing 80, 40, 20, and 10, it, it, it's pretty a, – a 43 works really well, too. And I used I, – I tend to hang out on 80, 40 – and 20 so i put a type 31 because the type 31 it uh, behaved a little bit better the way on the stuff that i made on uh, 80 meters and it behaved much better on the uh stuff at, down at 160 but i do not have a 160 antenna and i don't normally do that so i kind of don't care but anyways um what's the next did that hope that answered that question 43 is a really 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 calm and it works good yeah we don't need to uh dig yeah. deep into yeah. how, how they make the mixes and all that just know when you're out there shopping you know that 31 very you very know, popular if you got them if you if you just wound up with a handful of 43s and you're going to operate in the hand bands and you're, you're pretty much steering clear of 160 that's a that's a pretty good core that's why you see that 43 a lot you see 31 even if you even if you use 31 as you go up higher in frequency, it's not going to work quite as good, but depending on what you're doing, it, it may or may not matter. Right. And so number four. Yeah. What's that, Jason? <laughs> so this obviously would apply, you know, across the board, but I, I love the question. How high does an 11 meter inverted V have to be raised to acquire that omnidirectional radiation? Or, or for that matter, you know, Raising a inverted V or a dipole, you're just looking for that uh, correct SWR, and you'll notice your impedance, your 50 ohm, that magic 50 ohm, will change as you raise it and lower it. So, Kevin, what's the rule of thumb as far as building any kind of dipole? Because that's what an inverted V is, a dipole, even for our friends on 11 meters. Even for our friends on 11 meters. The answer is, if you can get your antenna approximately one half wavelength, off the ground or a little bit higher, that's a good thing. So you would use uh, 468 divided by the frequency in 11 meters. That'd be about 27 megahertz. And that number in feet is a half wavelength, and that's about where you'd want it to be. Now, to answer the other question, let's go to, uh, go to um, the inverted V part. If you were to take, you know, we can see the paper here. And you had a dipole or a doublet, and it was straight. Your feed point impedance will be, you know, approximately somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 ohms, plus minus. And as you drop these down into the classic inverted V, it gets much closer to 50 ohms, okay? Okay. And if you move them up and down, it'll change. So we could talk about that later, but there's people who are like, well, gee, how do I uh, can't climb up my pole and put my analyzer on there and measure it? Well, there is a way to uh, uh, null out or normalize out your cable before you hook it up and then plug it in and then do it. But we're not going to go over that tonight. So straight, closer to 70, inverted V, uh Closer to 50 ohms, give or take a few ohms, depending on how you have the thing set up. And uh, if you can get it a half wavelength off the ground, um, that would be great. And in some some locations, your feet where the dirt is might be the real depends on the your soil. 
in the conductivity and all that fancy stuff. It might be at your feet, might be three feet below your feet, might be 10 feet. I don't know. So general rule of thumb is measure from the ground up half wavelength and you'll probably be fine. So we're all the way up on number five. Yeah, number five. What do you think about that one? I don't uh, know, Jason. What do you think? Why don't you, why don't you read that to us? But I want you to use your ham radio TV voice, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> Would it be possible to run a T adapter and have two wire dipole antennas at once? Like having more wire in the air for better transmit and receive. More angles. Uh, two dipoles. So in other words, what he's describing is four legs, four copper wires instead of just one. And, uh, you know, is it doable? Can you have a dual dipole? What is that called? Well, the answer is sort of. Um, and I'm going to just refer you to the ARRL antenna handbook. There is a way. Hey, go to your to face. Take, what's that? We're missing your face. You're missing my face. Oh, I'm showing you this piece of paper. <laughs> you know, you know, folks. It's it, it, it's okay if you tune out because I'm, I'm and, and and only look at Jason because I'm I'm not that good at this. So, anyways, yes, you can have uh, multiple antennas out there, but they got to be some kind of phased array. So you will need. You know, we're not going to go into it tonight. But if you did have two dipoles up there and you had them spaced correctly and you fed them correct with the correct uh, feed line uh, and put a T at the feed point, yes, you can. You could do something like that. There's, there's uh, look, up, look up phased arrays and uh, take a look at that. There's guys out there that have all kinds of – they have uh, wire beams. They've got phased array. They got vert. They got these vertical uh, poles with multiple wires coming down, and they switch them around. There was uh, a station in the Midwest that had something like that. I don't know exactly what it was, but that guy could steer his forty meter signal like I've never seen before, and it was uh, it was a little on the complicated side, but he did a good job. So it can be done, but it's a little too deep for HRTV tonight. Yeah, yeah, that could be a whole video in itself building that thing. And I tell you, if you get it right, it could really be uh, quite the flamethrower, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, really put, put you out there. Yep. So let's, uh, let's go here to the next one. Um, we'll kind of tie okay. six and seven together in that uh, we've got some friends out there. And I want to let people know as we approach November, you know, we started out last week talking about microphone uh, connectors. That would be the, you know, connectors in your radio. And that was on purpose because we're going to be building up to a microphone you could buy and a mixer or maybe a cable, a cable from the microphone right to the radio. That's going to be coming up in November. But we got people out there. They're already doing this. They're already trying it. And um, a few things. You know, one is uh, why, it, why would you need to pass the mic audio or the mixer audio through some kind of transformer? And, and then the next question, Kevin, which, which is right around the same kind of idea a little bit, is um, he is using a, uh, a boom mic and a mixer, but he's getting all sorts of weird sounds and oscillations and feedback uh, when he transmits. So take it away. Well, you know, I'm going to suggest he just he stops transmitting right now. Oh, so come if on. If you're holding the button down right now, let go of it. No, I'm teasing. We want you to transmit. Okay, um, the weird what you it sounds like you're getting most likely you're getting RF back into your um, your microphone jack, and what happens is when you guys you were buying these radios, I had a sample sitting right here and I moved it. And, well, All right, well I I brought this up for for stuff like that. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, here's a here's a commercial microphone, and uh, you know, it's a you know, it's a Kenwood mic. It's got the RJ45 jack, and it's it's designed to be plugged into a Kenwood radio. It's just a simple, dumb push to talk microphone. Well, us being the uh, industrious ham radio operators that we are, we want to hook up mics like this, you know, 
or we want to grab a second microphone like this. <laughs> now you're just showing radio. off. So, <laughs> so our friends can, yeah, a little bit. So our friends can come in over and sit at our station. We can have, we can have ham radio uh, 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 talks with all of our buddies. What, what, what do they call? We're going to pass it around the table. So to actually answer the question, most likely you're getting RF into your radio. You need, and like we talked about, there's all different connectors. If you look it up on your on your radio, you're probably going to find that there's a mic wire and a mic ground. And you want to make sure that you're using the mic input and the mic ground, and and take care and don't and just whether it's grounded to the chassis or not, just assume that that mic ground is is floating. I mean, it may it may not be, but assume that it is. And wire that directly to your external mic. And just like last week, I showed you this uh, uh, three-pin XLR connector. So what would happen is on a, like a, uh, I'll use a number I think everybody knows, a Shure SM58 microphone, okay? So pin one is the shield. Pin two would go to the mic pin on your radio. Pin three would go to your um negative on your mic and then what you can do is so your cable is actually shielded then what i would do is get the the ground the actual chassis ground and put it to pin two excuse me to pin one because what you don't want to do is accidentally uh tie your mic ground to the uh dc ground or the radio ground because it may not be grounded inside the radio i don't know so just make sure you get your pins right and use a short cable. And another thing to do, too, is we talked a lot about antennas. In, in the next, one of the next questions talks about balance and about RF. If you have an antenna system that's just got the wrong length of cable, uh, no balance, too close to your house, not tuned quite right, and it runs down into your shack, you plug it into your tuner, your, your MFJ tuner, and you just tuned it, and you go, oh, now I've got a match. You have a match, but you might have a lot of RF coming down that shield in, coming into your shack. So if that's the case, you need to start with making sure your antenna system is as clean and as resonant as you can get it for the frequency that you want to use it on. That way your energy is going from your radio to your antenna and you're keeping it off the coax and you're doing your best to keep it out of your shack. Not to mention if you do all that and you give yourself a, um, a nice um, ground, RF ground, you know, uh, on your radio and your tuner, that, that would be something that would be a really, really good thing to do. Now, yeah, Kevin, you know, I uh, I experience a little bit of this as well. I don't always uh <clears throat> you know, I don't always practice what you teach me. But, you know, for example, here uh let me see. I can uh, I can I'm, cut I'm this. Moving, I'm moving to get get a prop. And I can drop keep, keep, keep talking while I get a prop. Drop that out. All right. So here is uh, you know, here's where I sit. This is uh in the garage here. And uh, I get some audio because, as you can see, my mixer is next to the radio and the tuner and the amplifier, and it's all sandwiched in. And then uh, this is what you call is a constant experiment. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real, folks. I am not that clean or organized. So this is a nightmare. And when I get on the radio on 20 and 40, I don't get a whole lot of feedback. But once I start heading to 80... I drive this thing nuts on 80 meters. I mean, it just goes, it just goes everywhere. So this is not a good idea. The next step would be put some stuff on like the next shelf, get it down over there. I mean, I mean, just, just do something, just do something better. Just, just do something. And it could, and it could, <laughs> could be, be wrong. As as, yeah. It could be as simple as, you know, working on the antenna system and keeping the RF or coming back in the shack. So let's get this finished answering the question here on the microphone. So we made sure the microphone, uh, we're, we're assuming that your antenna is fine and now we're going to wire it correctly to the radio. And now the next part of the question was, is, uh, 
um, somebody was where was it here? The, the transformer, and and the idea the is well, okay. In, yeah, it, gotcha. So what I did is I grabbed, um, I thought I grabbed two transformers because I wanted to show you a couple of ways that this works. And and for everyone that uh, is not overly familiar, a transformer, you're gonna have. A wire, right? A wire is going to come in. It's going to curl around. It's going to leave. Then on the other side, you're going to have another wire coming in, and it's going to curl around and it's going to leave. So, you know, if you can imagine my fingers, these are the coils. These coils are then sitting next to each other, and they're not physically touching, but they're electrically. I guess I can use the word conducting, uh, because got, audio you, is an you, AC you, circuit. Right. You've broken up your. You've broken up the opportunity for a ground a ground loop. So, on this here. So most of you know a transformer. On the diagram looks like this. And there are my fingers and knuckles. <laughs> right there. So there's your. There's one side of the transformer and there's the other side of the transformer. So they're isolated, but it passes the AC signal, which is what we want. So another thing. Well, I should have left this on. Maybe. Maybe this here. You could make your own. And let's let me get this picture here. Can you guys even see that? It's not quite zoomed yet. Or I should say focus, not zoomed. Well, it's this camera struggles with that. But maybe uh, fill the frame with your big hand and put it there in the center of your palm. Back up a little. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here. How about this? How's that look? Yeah, it's it wants to focus behind you more than in front. It's getting there. Okay. Oh, it almost had it. <laughs> you need uh you need some manual focus. Yeah, I do. Okay. Oh, here we go. To lock down that focus. Can you see it? Let's try to get it. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Uh, Dale was letting me know my finger coils looked more like jazz hands. <laughs> yeah. Is that better? Yes, that is better. Let me get that front and center for you. Okay. We see it. Take it away, Kevin. Yay. Okay. This is a transformer, and it's the one that we, I tried to show you, this little, this little bitty one here. It's exactly the same. And what I do is... I use these little line level transformers to isolate the audio. These are one, there's a, there are a thousand ohms, thousand ohms on this side, a thousand ohms on that side. And in this particular case, what I'm doing is, is I'm, uh, this is an experiment board. And uh, one of these days on uh, hamradiotv.com, we're going to have a little kit for you. And what it's doing is it's taking, it's taking it out. It's taking it out of the, uh, my mixer that I'm talking into right now and it has a 30 dB pad and it's putting it into my, my radio. So I've got my isolation right here. So I don't get RF and I don't get ground loops and things of that nature. Now, if I just needed a one-to-one, -one, just a transformer isolation transformer on my microphone, I could, I could, I could just use just the transformer. I wouldn't need that pad. And by the way, these transformers, you buy these online. There's six of them in here, and I've used four, four, I've used three. I got ten of them for like seven, uh, like ten bucks, like a dollar a piece. It's not the transformer; it's what you do with it. So, first, wire your microphone correctly, and I think a really big thing is make sure there's no RF coming back into your shack mm. because. That's that's going to be a real big problem. If you got RF coming back in your shack, you could you could you could you could put you could put microphone cables and junk till the cows come home, and it, it's still going to plague you. Yeah, hope that, that answers that. And, hope that answers that question. And that could be a lot to do with you know your antenna, your coax, the kind of ballon, the choke you're running on it. Yep. Uh, not to mention my 80 meters uh, ends like 10 feet behind my head. And, you know, so even if everything is right, if you're way close to your antenna and you're trying to run it with some power, you could still just be just, just, just yeah. hammering it in there. So we'll do a, we'll do a, we'll do a series on, on how we hook up stuff 
Now, just to give you an example, I operate on 80 meters all the time, 80 and 40 and 20 all the time. And I have just simple uh, inverted V-type antennas fed with coax with a ballon. And I have a what's called an amp supply. It's a uh, uh, LK500. LK it's a has a pair of 3-500s, so I can peak legal limit. So normally when I'm using it, I, I usually use it between uh, 4 and 700 watts is my output on sideband, my peaks. And I have absolutely no problem with my audio. And I have one of these mics up hooked up. I have a little mixer board hooked up. I have a, a DBX compressor limiter hooked up. I have the refrigerator hooked up, the microwave, and a touch lamp. No, not really. But it, it, all, it all works fine. It all works fine. So we can, we, we can go over that. Well, Kevin, we really only have time for one more question. Okay. Do you have, uh, do you have one you'd like to get to next? Because I know well, we've got a couple you, more in the list. but You know what? I can go over these next two in about 30 seconds, okay? All right. Uh, the next question was asking about uh, what sort of, what, what's the explanation of the balance, the RF choke? What does it do? Stray RF signals traveling down the feed line of the transceiver. Is this RF can be produced by, okay. And also, they're saying you get 500 to 1,000 miles from a balance. Is this kind of, okay. No. Your ballon does not give you 500 to 2,000 miles of coverage. Your antenna and the conditions to which we're operating that antenna gives you whatever coverage and distance you're getting. The ballon at the feed point of the antenna can serve a couple of purposes. One of them is an RF choke, to, and it also goes from balanced to unbalanced. So our balanced feed line, our balanced antenna, which is typically our inverted V, Gets fed by coax, so you put a decent balance on there, and that takes care of that. The next question is also about balance. And this person was talking about, I made this balance right here uh, about a month ago, and I told everybody, I just took a Type 31 core, and I put 10 turns of uh, RG303 on here, and I tested it, and holy cow, this thing works. It, 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 had a gr it works great as a balance. It has a, a great response from uh, uh, 3 megahertz all the way up to uh, uh, 10 meters, 28 megahertz. And it also has a really good common mode, which was in excess of uh, 25 dB, which was really, really good. The question we had uh, was, well, I saw that balance that Kevin made, and then I looked on the Internet, and I saw other people. They wound it five turns this way, and they went over this side underneath it five turns, so they're opposite. Yes, that is a textbook way to do it. Um, I am going to make, I have the parts to make another one. I'm going to make another one that's wound just like that, and we are going to measure them on the same test equipment. I have a Siglent a spectrum analyzer with the return loss bridge, and we will use that to measure <clears throat> the common mode and the response of this and the one wound the other way. And I was very, very surprised how well this thing worked. We've had a couple of viewers make them, test them on their uh, nano VNAs and use them. They've been very happy. It, guys, this was just a, hey, get a core, put 10 turns of Teflon cable on there, and boom, you're done. And it just happened to work good. So then it, hopefully that answers that question. Where have and you then, bought your cores? Um, I bought them from... Uh, uh, dx engineering and there's a you know what there's two or three places that have them uh digikey i think had them and there's another place out there i will get that information for you in the next week or, um that sells these at a at a pretty good price and they, they average depending on which core you're buying between about six and eleven dollars a piece but when you consider that a ballon wound with these materials and put into one of those little gray boxes could cost you as much as ninety dollars so you buy some wire you buy your core and a box you spend about 20 25 bucks and put a little bit of sweat equity in it you got yourself a pretty good balance and this is just one version of it there's two or three others that you can that you can do yeah i just shared so, a link uh palomar is the one i'm familiar with they got great stuff yeah and there's a that's that's one of them are those that got isn't it um there's I, it, it escapes me at the moment but the last question is really, really long, and this is, his name is Ocean. Ocean, I, I hope you're 
listening. And I'm going to, um, Ocean built a small FM transmitter to use on the FM broadcast band, which, by the way, is legal as long as you follow all the rules. And he was using it on 89.6 megahertz. So his question was, when he hooked his antenna up, the output transistor, the RF transistor that was driving the antenna was getting hot. But right here in his words, when a dummy load is connected, two big 5-watt 100-ohm resistors in parallel, so he has 10 watts at 50 ohms, it gets warm, and the transistor is not hurt anymore. So I'm taking that is his 50-ohm load on his homebrew FM transmitter. The load gets a little bit warm, but the transistors inside don't, and he's getting the proper measurements. So what that suggests to me, Ocean, is that your antenna system that you're hooking to it is probably not resident at that frequency. It could have a high SWR. So before you connect it back up to your, your transmitter, check your antenna and make sure your antenna is resonant. And to start out, for a half-wavelength antenna, use 468 divided by the frequency. In your case, it's 896 That'll give you the length of it. And if you want to make a quarter wave um, ground plane, it's 234 divided by the frequency. So it kind of sounds like you got a mismatch on your antenna and your output transistor is getting a little on the warm side. So uh, be careful. Check your antenna. And if you don't have an antenna analyzer, consider getting one to help you with your future radio and antenna experiments. Thank you, Kevin. That uh, you're, you're welcome, Jason. <laughs> that brings us to the end of this show. We're here every Wednesday. We'll be back next Wednesday. And like I said, month of November, we're going to be uh, we're going to be getting into more microphones and mixers and kind of how to have fun with that stuff. A few uh, other surprises, announcements. Uh, I hope to get to as well. We got some things up our sleeve. So 73, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight, and uh, and we'll see you next week. Are you going to wave, Kevin? I was, I'm <laughs>